Hello everybody and welcome to the second video about the new Eternal Lords expansion for Age of Wonders 3. Today we're going to be talking about Tigrans, as represented here by Mr. Kitty Cat, Anknaton Anorak, who is a Tigran sorcerer and an all-round nice guy. He is using the new Peacekeeper specialization, which is a specialization dedicated entirely to being good, which is why he's being accompanied by this chap, the Archangel, the ultimate tier 4 summon that comes with a specialization. It is a healing machine. It tears undead units to pieces with spirit damage. It can inspire people just by standing next to them and it has resurgence. So if you kill it, it will come back to life if you win the battle, which is great. Also to talk about in this video is one of the most exciting new systems, the race governance system. What that means is each race has five upgrades that unlock as you go through the game. We've um, started here with two of them unlocked, so I can show you. The Tigrans start here with two, level one, Patron. Uh, we can either make our Prowlers 15 gold cheaper to produce, which is the military option, or for the economic option, we can make Settlers cheaper to produce. Now, um, doesn't really matter. In this particular case, we'll choose cheaper Settlers, except that. We're also at level two. Normally, this would unlock around turn 20 or so for a normal player. We can either give our Tugran Cheetah units the Hurl Net ability, which is a ranged paralysis ability, or we can make our Tigran cities produce 10 gold for each observatory they have. Now, usually it, it depends on your situation, whether you want to choose an economic or a military thing, since, you know, it's a let's play, you want to see fights, we'll just choose a military thing. That's great. Hopefully we've got a cheetah lying around somewhere so we can show you that. There, there you go, to the east. Now, since we're a good guy, we don't want to solve everything through war. We are going to be the friendliest kitty cats. We're going to say hello to the little humans, and we're going to offer them vassalage. We shall kindly offer to let them become our servants, as it were, in return for our protection, which is typically the protection from us not attacking them, <laughs> killing them all. But still, it's a thought that counts. We are nice people, and they are now our ally. Open them up again. You can see here, our allies now they're actually giving us now a portion of their income you can see that 80% of their income comes in because they're our friends if we were to upset them in some way that income will go down but for now they're quite happy um, in five turns I think they could actually simply ask them to join our empire we could also start demanding things from them we could tell them they give me some units now or something like that it'll upset them but you know it'll let us get some stuff quickly if we happen to need it okay what else do we have now over here we have one a new structure, the Lost Library. We move an army onto there. Um, the Lost Library is undefended. Now since we're getting income from our vassal and the Lost Library gives 10 knowledge, if we were to clear it, which we will now do, um, we will get more knowledge as well. Okay, so here we have the Lost Library. As you can see, it's a quite a big library, so whoever lost it must have been quite forgetful. It's being guarded by these chaps, Frostling Reanimators coming to get me, shooting my chariot. Now you can see procking here is a despair debuff, which means that um, little chariot guy over here is going to be quite happy. Uh, despair is minus 300, uh, 300 morale and 20% spirit weakness, so it can be quite bad news, but uh, yeah, no big deal in this regard. We outnumber them quite heavily. So this guy is a Tigran Sabertooth Chariot. He is a kitty cat being pulled by more kitty cats. He is the cavalry unit, and his little trick is he can throw a sun spear, which is a ranged attack, which kind of makes him unique among the cavalry units. Generally, his um, stats-wise, he's not actually that impressive, but more than made up for it by his ranged attack. Also got this guy, the sun guard. Now, the sun guard is the pikeman, tier one, and he's a bit unique in that he's produced from the barracks, where most pikemen are produced from the war hall. He is also got a shield, a sun shield, which is a magical shield which protects against fire. And it's very useful also that the sun shield gives a resistance bonus against non-flanking attacks. Now, you might notice that this guy's resistance is only seven. All Tigrans have minus one resistance to make up for the fact that they move at ludicrous speeds across the battlefield. You might notice that this guy, every time he takes a step, is only using five move points instead of six. So essentially, Tigrans can always move one hex further on the world map. So, beat up the lost star. He's also using the Guard Breaker ability there, which is another thing that the Sun Guards have. Guard Breaker means if he hits the unit, it'll come out of guard, so other guys can do more damage to it. 
probably just want to finish this guy off, get him out of our way. Um, this lost soul over here, Necromancer Summon, will do more damage to upset people. So Mr. Chariot Kitty Cat over here would be in a lot of trouble as the lost soul got to him, so we'll get rid of that guy. Tigran Shredder is the archery unit. He throws magical throwing blades, well, probably not that magical. They're sort of like boomerangs, but sharp. Um, because they can be sort of thrown around corners, there's no line of sight penalty for them, which is quite nice. And they do bleeding damage. Well, don't do bleeding damage to lost souls, because lost souls won't bleed. But... Okay, that's the end of them. And let's go and shoot our new sun spear at one of these chaps. Take revenge! Revenge, Mr. Kitty Cat! Oh. It's not very enthusiastic. Yep, from all of the super low morale, he has fumbled his attack, so he only does half damage. But at least he set the guy on fire, so, you know, all's well that ends well. This, the Tigran Mystic, very special unit. Now, it is a um, support unit. Because we're a sorcerer, we can teleport, we have break control, um, it also has inflict stun. Magical thing about this guy, or her, is that she can turn into a kitty cat. So she is a kitty cat who turns into a kitty cat. I think you might be noticing a theme here. Strategically, it's not the best option right now, but we're going to do it anyway. Because see it? Yes! See? We are now an army of kitty cats. Charge! Doop -doop 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 -doop. Got him! Yes. See? Kitty cat vengeance. What else have we got? The Prowler. The Prowler is a normal infantryman. He is tier 1, but he's actually a little bit more powerful than the infantry that most other races get. He has this ability, Coup de Gras, does more damage to paralyzed people. He has martial arts, so less damage from counterattacks. Bloodthirsty, which means that he does more damage to people who are bleeding. So if my Shredder was to um, cause someone to bleed, he could come in and do more damage. And he has improved wall climbing, so if he's climbing up on walls, he has, there's no penalty for standing on the walls. Obviously, this comes with a price. He's more expensive than most infantry units, and he's produced from the War Hall, a Tier 2 unit, which is the same place most races get their pike from. We also have the Cheetah. Cheetah is the Tigran Irregular, and he now, as we got from our race command thing, has the Hurl Net ability. So that means maybe he can paralyze one of these reanimators to stop them giving us so much hassle. Uh, tactical imminent R ring. You? Paralyzed? Ooh, it didn't work. Oh well, if he had been paralyzed, this guy could have run over and done more damage. But as it stands, I guess we'll um, go and set fire to this guy. Actually, he's on fire. He'll probably burn to death anyway. He can all... And... Okay, and now we would normally be able to cast spells, but the Lost Library is protected by an anti-magic field. So yeah, that's not going to be happening anytime soon. He burns to death. And yeah, what are we going to do? Oh, Prowler's in trouble. Another sound tactical decision from me. Oh well. Bye bye, Mr. Kitty Cat. Your sacrifice will be lamented. Okay, and um, now. Um, oh wow, he's super upset as well. Not a happy place they've got here, is it? Right, um. Right. Charge over. Munch them. Let's see. Die pants? Yep. Still not finished. But got another trick up our sleeve. Cheetahs have another ability here, Pounce. Pounce is a little bit of a teleport that says jump in behind a unit and hit them. Also, another bonus of Pounce is that we end up in guard mode. So if we were ended up in a very flanked position, which obviously could happen if we just jumped behind a random enemy, we're a little bit more protected from flanking attacks. And let's just finish this off. Just run behind this guy and flank him to death. Ha! Right, I can't hit. Vengeance of the kitty cats, we rule supreme! Okay, now, the advantage of taking a lost library is it gives us a spell from our spell books. So, we have gotten this spell, which we could have researched, now we don't have to, and 21 research points, that's quite nice. And now, if we go back to our village, we'll see. It's now giving us a little bit of knowledge from the lost library. Okay, so what else are we going to do? Um, spells. Right, now, we have this spell here, Spiritual Freedom. I already mentioned we are part of the Keeper of the Peace specialization. Spiritual Freedom is a spell that's part of that. Um, all of the new specializations have a spell equivalent to this. We cast it on the city, and every unit produced from this city will have a buff. It will also be 
dedicated to good. So if we check out the Prowler, who is now cheaper, because we chose that, I think, um, we will see that he has the Meditate ability, which he's gotten from that spell. He also has this, dedicated to good. Dedicated to good means that if we do not have a good alignment, he will be upset with us. At the moment, we're neutral, so it's kind of, yeah, we can just kind of ignore it. It's a minus 200 morale. If we were evil, it would be very bad news, and we really generally wouldn't be able to use the unit. So the spell essentially forces us to stay good, but in return gives us much more powerful units. Um, we want to defend the city a bit more, so we'll build a Sphinx in here. It's always good. So this is the um, tier 3 Tigran. Get to see him in action in a little bit. We'll go up north, see what we can find. Hello, Fjarnor. I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that. This is the bad guy. He has declared war on us. He is cold and mean and represents everything that kitty cats hate. So we shall take terrible, terrible vengeance upon him. If we capture this watchtower. Oh. Yep, we can see there he is up there. He's being. City is quite heavily defended. This, the Dread Reaper, the ultimate summon of the Necromancer class, along with a sizable army of Frostling units who seem to be sitting in tropical terrain. A little bit upset about it. Anyway, still much more than we can afford to cope with our little three-person army, even with an angel backing us up. So, after got another little army conveniently placed down here. We can send north for backup. We'll come up here. And we have a spell which can help us as well. Rally the Populace is another Keeper of the Peace spell. Let's play next turn. And I think that's everything for now. So end the turn. And conveniently, our race command is leveled up again, allowing us to choose a tier 3. This typically in a normal game would appear in, say, turn 40 or so. Uh, we can choose between having better sphinxes or a cheaper fire temple. The fire temple is the building which produces the Sphinx. So we can essentially choose between making cheap Sphinxes easier to get and getting an extra bonus from the fire temple, um, 20 knowledge in this case, or better Sphinxes. And in this case, we're just going to have better Sphinxes. Except. Also, this has popped us to inform us that the new beacon tower, part of the new unifier victory condition, has been unlocked. The Unity Beacon system is a new victory condition that's put in in the expansion. What it means is once you reach champion level of race governance with a race, we can build a Unity Beacon in one of our cities. If I have a look over here. Here, Unity Beacon. This costs a ridiculous amount of gold, but once it's produced, it will give our entire empire a happiness bonus. It will also give everybody else's empire a happiness penalty. This beacon represents the fact that kitty cats are destined to rule the world. It's so magical and powerful that everyone in the world begins to believe it and starts to riot against their masters. Once the beacon tower has been produced, we can then move forward and we can produce a beacon fire. As the beacon fire is being lit, everybody now super begins to believe that the kitty cats are the true masters, riots go stronger and we get a bigger happiness bonus. Once the fire is lit, the unity beacon is completed, massive riots all over the world, big unhappiness penalties over there, big happiness bonuses over here, and if we can get enough beacons lit, we win the game. So it's a sort of uh, diplomatic turtling victory. If you can set up a big empire, defend your borders well enough and get these beacons up before your opponents do, it's a way of winning. But um, obviously we don't have time to sit around for the 40 or 50 turns it would take to achieve that, so I'm going to have to leave that to your imagination, I'm afraid, and go back to the case at hand, which is this city over here. Okay, rally the populace. Now, target enemy city suffers from blah blah blah. Okay, what this spell essentially does is upset the city a lot, but more importantly, it makes a city very likely to rebel against its master and hopefully join us. Well, in fact, almost guaranteed join us because we're the person who runs the spell. So we'll bring this army up and hopefully next turn we will be able to um, invade. Also over here, got this army. Maybe might as well keep exploring over here in case by chance there is another city that we might want to have a look at, which there is. Deal with that next turn. And, and turn. Liberate Lashimi. Okay. 
Because the spell has been cast on the city, they have decided that they hate their master so much, they want to join our team. Join Team Kittikup. Liberate the Shimi. Um, please help us overthrow our corrupt oppressor. Yes, I will. Okay, now that it's been accepted, when we invade, the populace is going to help in the battle. They will throw the doors open for us, and they will have stolen military supplies, and will be attacking and joining us in battle. They'll spawn units to help in combat. You can actually get this to occur without using the spell, by essentially making it so that the city likes you a lot more than it likes its master. But um, it's a little bit too complicated to explain for now. Anyway, let's invade. Manual combat. Okay, here we are. We have come to liberate the oppressed kitty cats of this city. You can see that they've already thrown the gates open for us, which is handy. Now, this is a Tigran city. There's an explanation, by the way, of what Betrayal actually does. Oh, all of the enemies have minus 600 morale as well. They're very upset because they know that the people they're protecting are not supporting them. The Dread Reaper ominously floating towards those guys. They're kind of rolling out of the... Um, Building out as a city. They don't actually have any ranged units at all, or very few ranged units, so they probably decided that they might as well just come straight out because, yeah, not much point in um, standing behind those doors. So, see in the background, nice bit of example of Tigran architecture, big pyramids. Now, what's going on here? Yeah, you might have wondered where this guy's come from. This cheetah has actually been spawned as part of the betrayal. The populace are rising up and coming out onto the field of battle to join us. Rather unfortunately for this guy, he's um, not going to be contributing much since he's been frozen by a snowscaper. But, you know, these guys could probably help, you know, cannon fodder and such. So, what have we got? Okay, super cool unit, the Tigran Sphinx. This is tier 3. Um, it is actually an irregular unit, which means it is a combined melee and um, ranged attack unit. It has sun disc, it shoots laser beams out of its eyes. It can cause fear and it actually does quite a lot of damage as well. These values are actually much higher than normal since we took the attack bonus option for race governance for Sphinxes. We've also got this chap, the Archangel. Oh, sorry, it's a lady. We have this lady. Um, she is essentially a tier four killing machine who I've already discussed. She is going to be extremely useful for taking out this Reaper. She's going to use the ability Meditate, which is the same ability we gave the people um, produced in the city with the spell earlier. Essentially, burn up all your action points, give yourself a nice buff. She gave herself equanimity of mind, plus three physical damage. Very nice. It'll last till the end of battle. Um, what are we going to do? Let's let them come to us since they've so um, helpfully come out of the city. So we'll set up a nice little sort of defensive line. I'm sure there's a tactical word for this in sort of battlefield stuff. I have no idea what it is. Send our little sphinxes forwards. And the Tigran Mystics can be over there. Used up all your action points. Now, time to use some tactical magic. We've got a lot of very, very powerful spells as part of the Peacekeeper thing. I think the most important, the most fun one anyway, is this Shield of Light. All of the enemies get 20% blight um, spirit weakness, and the target. Use it on the angel. Whenever she's struck, she will do damage and even daze the person who struck her. So it's a version very similar to the static shield that other units, as a sorcerer gets. Yeah. Um. Oh. More guys coming in to aid the cause. <laughs> was um, the ice measure effect from the um, ice queen, rustling unit. He's super upset but can still obviously pack a punch. Invoke Death is a very powerful ability from the Reaper. He essentially counters him. Because that essentially either you save, in which case your max hit points goes down by 40, which means you can get one shot hit by two and have a regular stood on the wall, or you simply die straight away. So yeah, this guy's really not to be messed with. But I think the first concern is to get this um, Ice Queen off our back. Um, how's the best way of doing that? Um, Actually, this guy's probably more of a threat. Let's just turn the Ice Queen round so she's not a threat anymore. Okay, now this guy can 
fly away, because she's not watching it, we'll fly away and land here. We can start doing some damage to these guys. We're going to use the laser beam from the eyes ability. Boop, boop. Sun disc. Now, um, a lot of these guys have fire weakness because they're frost links, and the undead have fire weakness as well. Certainly uh, coming in here from a position of strength. Notice has a range of three, which hopefully means we can land on the other side and do it again. Oh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> can I still move? Do I have any move points left? I've got a move point left. It's okay. Right. <laughs> Tactical genius over here. Right. Blast him. Poof. Got him. Okay. Now you notice. Bam. When the, um, these guys... The uh, Frostling Royal Guards die, they explode and blast everyone nearby with ice damage. So kind of lucky we um, kind of dodged a bullet there. Now, the Archangel is going to now completely murder the Reaper. <laughs> I swear to you, the Reaper is an incredibly powerful unit capable of doing terrible things to lots of, um, lots of people all at once. It really is not as pathetic as I'm about to make it look. Bye. Yep. <laughs> oh! Forgotten about that? Yeah, he explodes when he dies as well. Void explosion. Everyone nearby takes ice and spirit damage, so it's like he did kind of get the last laugh in. But, um, yep. Right, last thing. Let's um, attack the mammoth. Probably best is to like hit him with um, this castigate ability. Is it called castigate? No, no magic bolts. Castigate's the other ability from the first ones. Okay, shoot him. That's the end of him. And what else do we want to do? Yep, you can contribute! You can do your bit, Mr. Cheetah. We appreciate that you've come in to try and help us get your city back. So you can pounce over there. <laughs> Donk. Anyone else? Nope. Oh, we have a scout. Oh, of course, it's a warlord. And um, in betrayal, the city will produce in this betrayal event any unit that it itself could actually potentially build. So since it's a warlord city, it can make a scout for us, which is a new warlord unit. High speed, light sort of skirmishing unit. Very fast. Try and um, get in to join in. Mr. Anorax. So over here. Can you contribute. Oh, right, yeah. The Frost Queen. Aha. Um, <laughs> anything we can do about that? Um, fireball? Always good. Ooh, let's safeguard something. Who is he going to pick on? Aha. Right, this is a nice example of something we can do. This Tigran over here, Cheetah, has got five hit points. We've got a safeguard on it. That gives him 100% protection against all damage types. Ah. Unfortunately, the, he's already had 60% frost weakness, so unfortunately it's not safe against frost damage, so that might have been a bit of a waste of time. Might not actually work. But uh, normally that would keep the units alive if they didn't already have a severe elemental weakness. Oh well. It's only a cheater. He'll be fine. Right, let's go. Oh. Donk. Cheetahs? Now, yeah, cheetahs are melee units and they're ranged units, so they really didn't stand much of a chance. Now, this guy has set a pledge of protection on the um, ice cream. Now, frostlings are actually a matriarchal society. The women are in charge, and these guys, the Royal Guard, are created with magic to keep them alive, which is how they have this sort of absorb pain-like ability, which lets them transfer damage from the ladies to themselves. So it's probably a good idea to kill this guy before we try and take out the ice cream. Get him. Oh yeah. <laughs> Things to remember, do not attack pikemen with flying units. Pikemen have a plus five damage bonus against flying units and take less damage from flying units as well, which is why my tier three unit just got murdered by a tier one unit. Okay, let's just shoot him. No? Okay, now the ice queen over here is um, slightly less protected. I was just hit it with the angel. Beat her up. Bonk. Awesome. Victory! Hooray for us! Okay, and there we have it. The city is ours. Now, normally when you take a city, it becomes occupied automatically and you have to absorb it or migrate it or something. Since the city betrayed its owner to join us, we don't have to do that. It's immediately under our control. So we've got a nice new sparkly Tigran city to start doing stuff in. However, we are good people. We don't just want Tigrans, we want Frostlings as well, because in order to win the beacon victory, we need two beacons, and we can only do one beacon per, ra per 
a race we can control. We come over here. This is a Frostling city, and as soon as we capture it, we'll be able to start collecting race governance for XP for them. And this auto combat. Thank you very much. Now, if you look over here, new option releases Vassal which will put it into the same state as that human city that we have to the south. Doing this will give us 50 goodness points, which is something that we need for our specialization, but will also give us this, 50 race happiness for Frostlings. I'm sure, I am sure, thank you. Okay, so if we have a look at the diplomacy screen, overview of race happiness. Race happiness is a new system that was actually put into the patch. You don't need the expansion for the race happiness itself. What it means is the way I treat cities of different races will change how that entire race sees me. I am Tigran, so I get start with 250 points with the Tigran race. I've also got an extra 100 points of happiness for gaining a city for a betrayal event. Now though, the Frostlings, well, once the vassalization is complete, I'll get the plus 50 happiness with the Frostlings too. If we go back to the Tigrans can see me gaining race happiness XP, that goes a bit faster because the Tigrans like me. The happier I am, the faster I'll get XP with Tigrans. So, whereas before in the game it was possible to simply invade everyone, declare war on whoever you like without really facing any consequences for it, now it's much more important to decide who am I going to declare war on, do I really want to declare war on this city because Declaring war on a Tigran city, an independent Tigran city, could upset Tigrans everywhere. Declaring war on a Tigran city will reduce that happiness by 50 points. If that was to drop below, say, 200, then my Tigran units here would lose this nice morale bonus that they're getting from race happiness. Similarly, my Tigran city would lose the plus 100 happiness it's getting from race happiness. Also, it's not even possible to light a beacon unless you have 200 race happiness. So is it vitally important to the new systems that you keep your race happiness up? Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's about it. As we would continue playing in this game, we would get more frostlings, build up the race happiness with the frostlings, and eventually build a beacon that shows the true eternal friendship that exists between kitty cats and snowmen. And in doing this, we can bring about a new era of world peace with cats. Thank you very much.